right. Let's get going. Good morning. Good morning. It's Friday, end of the week. And I'm sure everybody's tired, tired of working on assignment two, tired of this stupid class, tired of talking about file systems. So uh, let's everybody get up, stand up. The actual standing, Jason, I'm looking at you. You're always the last person to stand up. Uh, how long will everybody have to wait for Jason to stand up? Hold up. Oh, Dachi, too. Oh, I don't know, man. You put me in a tough spot. Dachi? Your leg hurts. See, try that excuse next time. That's more effective. All right, everybody sit down. <laughs> should have should have class standing one day just to see if people are. But OK, so today we're going to talk about log structured file systems. This is the last file system that we're going to talk about. Um, and that's like a sign that you know everything that in, in happened in file systems that was interesting happened before or around 1990, right? Because here we are, we're, we're, we're coming ever close to the present. We spent uh, Wednesday in the 80s talking about FFS, and now we're on to a new decade of, of innovation in computer file systems. But we're going to talk about LFS. LFS is a, is, a, is a fun design for file systems, so it should be kind of a fun lecture. There's some fun history here as well that, gets, that plays into this story, OK? So assignment three is on its way out. We're just working out the last kinks with it. Uh, assignment two is, if, if you've taken all your late days, I think if I calculated correctly, assignment two must be turned in by tomorrow at midnight. So um, that, that's it, right? Uh, and we're working on the assignment two solution. I, I kind of hacked it together yesterday using the old code, and it seems to work. But I'm going to bang out a little bit more um, you know, if you, in case you guys would like to use that going forward on assignment three. If you don't have. You know, look, I mean, I, I think it's a really baller move to keep using your own code base, right? Maybe we'll have some awards at the end of class for people who have not chosen to use the solution sets. Um, but at the same time, if you don't want to spend your time working on assignment three, debugging all of your assignment two problems, uh, and your assignment two isn't really in a, in a strong working state, then I would suggest that you, you grab the solution and, and sort of just move on, right? You know, uh, lick your wounds, take your losses, and kind of, kind of move forward. Um, all right, so uh, we talked about the Berkeley Fast File System on Wednesday, right? So anybody have any questions about the Berkeley Fast File System, right? Really kind of beautiful uh, file system design, very intimate with the properties of disks. Any questions about FFS? Going once, going twice. Oh, oh. Can I ask a question not about the Berkeley uh, File System? I guess. <laughs> um, in a Windows Fed 32 uh, system, yeah. and uh, you cannot transfer uh, file larger than 45. Right. Uh, why do we need the limitation? Why do we need the limitation? We don't. Right. And it would be great if it didn't exist. Right. Is there any similar limitation in Linux system? No, actually. Um, so uh, there, there probably was at some time in, in earlier versions of, of Linux systems, right? Uh, so look, I mean, um, er early file system designs made assumptions about the size of files, right? And those assumptions seemed reasonable at the time, right? So, you know, if, if it's 1980 or 1990 and, and you're, you know, your state of the art machine has 128 megabytes of RAM, then maybe you're thinking, ah, oh, four gigabyte file, that sounds like plenty, right? Um, so, so no, 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 there, there's no reason for that limitation. That, that's, that's what some people would consider to kind of be a bug or, or, or a malfeature or something like that. But there, there's, no, there's no good reason for it, right? And it, and it frustrates and irritates people who have to work with those file systems, right? Um, I'm trying to remember, the, the, I was reading about UFS because FFS has kind of evolved into UFS now, the Unix file system. And I think new versions of Uni, uh, the Unix file system can support file sizes up to a, uh, up to a, a word I hadn't even heard of before. It's like nanobytes or something. So I think that's like lots of bytes, right? It's not quite like Google bytes, but it's it's good. It's good moving in that direction, right? So so yeah. So so now I think people start to assume that files might get really big, right? Like you know we used to think, oh yeah, four gigabyte files never going to happen, right? And now that's a serious limitation on those file systems. So I think new file system designs are kind of like, OK, look. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a, the, a, the longer IP addresses, I, IPv6, right? It's like, look, we ran out of IP addresses once. 
So now let's create enough IP addresses so that we can assign every atom in the universe its own IP address, right? And then we'll have enough, we think, right? Unless some atoms start to want two, and then you're going to have an issue, right? So, um, so anyway, yeah, uh, th th that's just a limitation of, of FAT32 that's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, all right, any questions on FFS before we talk a little bit about? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, but, but, but I mean, that's, yeah, yes and no, right? No, I think that's where that comes from, but I don't know why, right? Because on an, ex on, on a, on an indirect block file system, right, you can essentially, the file size, you, you, could, you could use eight bytes on the file system to store the file size. That's not the end of the world, right? Um, you know, to, ooh, you know, I'm, I'm wasting four bytes so that I can have a file bigger than, uh, and, and depending on, remember we talked about the indirect block me mechanism that allows us to, to associate many data blocks with a single file. So depending on how uh, I set that up, I can potentially support like really, really massive files, right? So if I have like these quadruply indirect blocks, right? Then you know every time I add an every time I add a layer of indirection, I, I'm I'm adding like almost an exponent to my file size, right? So so they can get big pretty quick. Any other good questions? Uh, any other questions about file systems in general, FFS in particular? Um, you know what? I have enough to cover today. I'm not really going to go through the FFS review. I'll just let you guys look over this yourself. These are just copies of the, the old slides. Right? Um, so remember, FFS did. Both seek planning, right, with this idea of cylinder groups, trying to keep things that are related, almost like its whole little mini file system uh, on each cylinder group, right? So without leaving the cylinder group, without moving the head very far, I can allocate inodes, I can allocate data blocks, I can, you know, uh, hopefully put things in directories, because hopefully the directory that I'm operating on is in my cylinder group itself, right? So these are, it's almost like breaking the disk up into little mini file systems that are all trying to be located on a cylinder, single cylinder group so I don't have to move the heads, right? And then, you know, FFS also did this funky rotational planning stuff, right? So just geometry information was stored in the super block and used to try to actually uh, figure out, you know, when I was done reading a certain sector or a certain uh, block on a particular track, where was the head going to be next, right? So, so there were a lot of, like, really delicate, uh, intricate optimizations that FFS did to try to improve the performance of slow disks, okay? And, and we were kind of, at least I was kind of simultaneously amazed and, and uh, bothered by this. Um, all right, so, so yeah, any more other questions about FFS? I want to get to LFS because LFS is fun, all right? Okay, so again, we talked about FFS, circa 1982, right? Uh, you know, most of you guys weren't even born yet. I was three years old. Uh, you know, you guys, we just don't have memories of computers that are that old, right? Okay, so now fast forward. It's now 1991, right? So, so now we're getting into at least the distant future. Some of you may have been born by that point, although probably some of you haven't been. Um, so what's different about 1991 from 1982? Well, I, I collected some information from the internet. So uh, big hit in 1982, Eye of the Tiger. You know, great song, actually. Uh, 1991. Everything I do, I do it for you. Eh, I don't know. Like, maybe not my favorite song. I was going to play this in class, but then I was like, no, I didn't really want to play Brian Adams at this hour. It's just too early for that kind of stuff. Um, all right. Uh, a hit movie in 1982, Gandhi. Uh, 1991, Silence of the Land. So we're getting darker, right, I think, as a society. Now, 1982, big hit about you know, a, a man who single-handedly uh, single helped overcome an entire empire. And, and then we're talking about some guy who likes to eat people. Um, so this is, this is different. Um, but OK, what about disks, right? What, what about disks and computers? What's changed about disks and computers, do you think, from 1982 to 1991, right? I mean, again, you guys weren't alive, but, 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 you know, I mean, you guys know about Moore's Law. You know about the personal computer, uh, you know, revolution. So, so what's happened during this time period, right? So disk bandwidth is improving a lot. Remember, we talked last time about how FFS was actually built for systems that couldn't stream data across the bus fast enough to actually keep up with the rotational movement of the disk, right? So now this problem is being addressed, and we actually can, can stream reads or writes to the disk much, much faster, OK? Assuming something, OK? Uh, computers have more memory, right? You know, uh, the, the, you know, the big, fancy machines that these guys were hacking on at that time were like 128 megabytes of memory, 
Wow, that, 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 that was like a new feature. And actually, there, there was like, uh, it was 64 bytes on one bus and then 64 bytes on another. It was something hacky you had to do to actually even jam 128 megabytes of memory. Now I think your phone has like eight times that much memory, right? So this is, but th these were the state of the art servers at the time. Um, what about disk seek times? Who thinks they know what happened to disk seek times? 1982, 1991. Maybe slightly better, but still really slow, okay? So you've got this improvement in disk bandwidth. But that assumes that you don't have to you know, uh, bounce the heads all over the disk. Right? This is new. I'm going to walk down an aisle today. <laughs> I'm not doing it very well. We've got to practice. Um, OK, so, so, uh, so this is assuming you know, disk bandwidth is going up, but this is assuming that you don't have to move the heads. Right? If you've got to move the heads, then you, know, you have this great improvement in bandwidth, but it's being wasted because I'm, I'm bouncing all over the disk. OK? All right, so, so and, and here's, here's the question that, that uh, computer scientists at Stanford were asking themselves. So, look, I, I still have seeks, and seeks are terrible, right? Seeks are, are what make the disk slow, okay? But I've got a lot of growing bandwidth, and I want to get to that. That's, that's frustrating me, because I've got these seeks that are preventing me from really utilizing all this new bandwidth that's being added to these devices, okay? And of course, you know, the best way to improve performance is to take advantage of that bandwidth, right? So I've got to solve this pesky seek issue, OK? And I've got a bunch of spare memory, right? Systems are being built with more and more memory, OK? So, so what do you guys think I'm going to do here? Caching. Caching, all right? I can use a cache, right? Again, this is our, you know, one of our system design principles. I'm going you know, to make a big, slow thing look faster by using a cache, right? We've talked about this over and over again. So I'm going to put this. So, and now I've got this bigger cache on my system, more memory. And so I can cache the heck out of the file system. And this is going to fix everything, right? I'm going to use the cache. It's going to fix everything. It's going to be awesome. I've got this buffer cache thing. It's going to be huge. And it's just going to soak up all the traffic to the disk, right? It's problem solved, right? This is a short lecture today, you know? Everybody, everybody can go home. We you know, ready for the weekend, OK? All right, so I've got this huge cache, right? And, and what is that cache going to soak up, right? What is that cache we think going to be great for soaking up? It, shouldn't, it, it should mean that I should barely have to do any what? Disk I.O. No, 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 disk I.O., but what kind of disk I.O.? Ooh, writing and reading, Ooh, that's all disk I.O. What about, what's the difference between reads and writes? Reads don't modify data, right? So with a cache, once I put a block into the cache, that cache should just sit there soaking up all the reads, and I'm golden, OK? So caches should just you know, uh, improve the performance of reads dramatically, right? Why doesn't this apply to writes? Why can't I just have a cache sit there and soak up all the writes? Because if they don't get to the disk, then the data is actually not on the disk, right? And if the system fails or whatever, then I'm going to have an issue, right? So, so this, this, this starts to become this, um, you know, this, this identification of the fact that caches are great for reads, right? Caches are fantastic for soaking up all this read traffic. But they are not as effective with writes, because the writes have to go to disk. It's just that frustrating part about disk where we actually have to send data to them if we expect it to be preserved. Right? I wish we could eliminate that feature. Um, that, however, the cache is also going to help us with writes. Right? And what the cache is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to coalesce writes in memory okay? until we can get you know, a bunch of writes together, and then we can do them all at once. Right? So the, the, the cache does help with writes a little bit. So like writing one byte, right? you know, doing 10 one byte writes to one block shouldn't cause 10 writes to the disk. Right? It should cause eventually one write to the disk. Okay? So the cache helps with writes, but not to the degree that it helps with reads. Okay? So we've been talking about sort of standard file system designs for a couple of weeks, and I want you guys to just for a minute, and I know you guys, I, I know that, you know, at least with me, you know, leisure and, you know, uh, reading magazines and, uh, you know, imbibing certain kinds of beverages helps me forget things anyway. Um, but let's, for, just, just for a minute, please try to forget everything that you've learned about file system design, right? So, and, and answer this simple question. I want to avoid doing seeks. 
right? The cache is going to help me with reads. The cache is going to soak up reads, but I've still got to do writes. So what's the best way to avoid seeks when I'm writing data? What's the best way? I've got a bunch of writes to do, and I don't want to do seeks. So what do I do? What do I do? What's the most obvious thing to do? I don't want to do seeks. So what do I do? I just don't do seeks, right? And I write everything to basically one place on the disk. Now, not the same place. This is entirely right, because then I would lose a lot of data, right? But I just try to keep the heads in the exactly same spot, and I just keep adding stuff, right? I just keep adding stuff to the same location, and I do the smallest seek possible. So I write 4K, and then I, you know, I, I get to the next block, and then I write the next block, and I just I write, I lay them out sequentially on disk, OK? So I'm just going to write everything to the same place. And this is the key insight behind log structured file systems. We'll talk about how they work, right? So there's two guys at Stanford. Um, Mendel Rosenblum on the bottom was a, uh, we believe was a PhD student at the time. He's now a faculty member there. And this is John Oosterhout, who's, who's an extremely well-known faculty member at Stanford. So they had this insight, which is, if we want to avoid doing seeks, we should just stop doing them. Right? And we should write everything to one place in the disk. And then we'll deal with the consequences of that decision. Right? We'll, spend, we'll spend the rest of today talking about what the consequences of that decision are, right? or what they are. Okay? So, okay, so again, main idea. I treat the disk as a single append-only log, right? log structured file systems. All the writes are appended to the end of that log. Okay? Anytime I write anything, it goes to the end of the log. Okay? It sounds like a great idea, right? You know, easy. Now I've just got this big log with a bunch of junk in it, right? Um, so how do we actually do this, right? Okay, so, so let's look at what happens. So let me re refresh your memory a little bit about what happens with a normal write. Okay, so this is a normal write on a standard file system that has data structures spread all over the disk. It's not this log structured file system uh, thing. It's a normal file system. So okay, I wanna, I wanna do a write, okay? And I want to change one byte in my file, right? What do I normally have to do? Okay? Well, I have to do a series of seeks, reads, and writes. Okay? The first thing I might have to do is I might have to do a seek to read the inode map, right? Figure out where the, the, the data, where the inode corresponding to this inode number is, right? Now I've got to do another seek to read the inode, right? So I've got to move to some other place to actually read the inode to figure out where the data blocks are, right? Now I've got to seek to the right data block that I need to modify. Right? This actually might involve a couple of seeks if I'm using a multi-level index. But let's just pretend it's just one more seek right, to get to the data block. And I'm going to do a write. Right? And now I might need to update the metadata stored in the inode, like the modification time. So I'm going to have to seek back and do another write to the inode. Okay? So this is four seeks, two reads, two writes. Okay? And let's look at how it looks on disk. Right? So I seek to somewhere, and let's say my iDone map is like way at one end of my disk where I know where to find it. So I do the read there. Okay. Now I do a seek. I find the inode I wanted. I read the inode. Now I find the data block I want. It's somebody else. I've got a, this is my second seek. And now I'm going to seek back, and I'm going to modify that inode. Right? So now the disk is done, you know, one, two, three seeks in just sort of some random pattern across the disk. We've talked about ways to try to optimize where the stuff ends up. Right? But still, like the, uh, the optimization strategies that we've looked at aren't perfect, and, and they're still going to lead to seeks, right? OK. So let's say, OK, let's say that, that I'm going to, now let's say that we have this nice cache, OK? And the cache is essentially going to soak up reads, meaning that reads are going to hit the cache. Let's just assume the worst, best, blah, blah, blah. Best case scenario here, and that the, the reads that we need to do are all in the cache already, so I don't need to read them again. So that means that the inode map is cached, so I don't need to, to uh, read that off the disk. I can find that in memory. The inode itself is also cached, right? So I can, I can avoid doing these first two seeks, right? But I still have you know, two operations to do on disk, and some potentially large seek between these two these two structures, right? And again, I mean, a lot of file systems do a lot of work to try to put these things close together on disk, right? But the log structured file system does an even better job because, again, all the writes go to the end of the log, okay? 
So this is my LFS file system, and this is the log. I'm going to tell you exactly what's in the log in a second, right? But the log is uh, what I maintain in an LFS system is a pointer somewhere to the end of the log, right? So this part of the disk is considered to be completely clean, free of any useful data, right? Any useful data, or potentially we'll, we'll talk about uh, unuseful data is stored in the log, right? So I've got my log here, and I'm just appending here, and I'm just going to pen, 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 pen. Look at that. Look at those appends by me jiggling the laser pointer. That's pretty cool. Um, anyway, I'm going to append, pen, pen uh, here to the end of the log, and, and that's kind of that's how my log file structure file system is going to work. But but how do I how do I actually do this? Okay. So let's say that at some point previously, remember everything on the file system is in the log somewhere. And it all got there because I appended it to the log at the last time that I modified it or wrote it. Okay? So the current inode right, is in the log somewhere. All right? But let's say it's cached in memory. And the current data block that I'm uh, modifying is also in the inode. Uh, sorry, in the log. Right? So when I, what, what happens when I actually do the modification? So what's, remember, there's, there's two things I need to change. I need to change the data block because I need to change the data that's in the data block, and then I need to change the inode because I need to update some metadata about the file. All right? So where do I put the new data block? Anybody? Where do I put the new data block? <coughs> At the end of the log, right? So there's my new data block, OK? And then I'm modifying something else. So where do I put the new inode? At the end of the log. Okay? And I've got to update the inode to point to my new data block. Let's say this is a file that only has one data block associated with it, right? So when I write the new inode, I can just write a pointer to this one data block, and then I'm good. Okay? Now, what's the problem here? What, 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 what's the last thing I, I potentially need to do here? Well, right. So now this is my most up-to-date copy of the inode, and this is my new copy of the data block. So these two things are now stale, right? They're, they're no longer needed. And so I need to free them, OK? And when I free things from the log, it creates these holes in the log that I'm going to have to fight to work with later, OK? But, but at least conceptually, this is very nice, right? And this is essentially how it works. If I, I, I could have done a more complicated example. It would have taken me another hour. But um, you, know, you can imagine if I had an inode that had pointers to multiple other data blocks that were in the log that I wasn't modifying, I would just write the inode, and I would, I would keep those pointers to those data blocks, right? Now, if I'm doing reads from the log, right, I would have to find the inode, which we'll talk about in a sec, and then I would have to locate other things in the log. So it's possible that reads from a log structured file system can bounce around the disk, right? Because there's no way to know what I'm going to read, right? And so the reads can happen anywhere in the log. But remember our assumption here. Why don't I care about reads skipping all over the disk? Because they're normally going to be cached, because my big fat big memory cache is going to soak up most of my read traffic. Right? And so if most of the traffic that's going to disk is writes, and all my writes go to the appending to the append only log, then I'm minimizing my seeks. Right? So most operations that go to disk are writes. Most writes don't seek very far at all. Right? They're essentially just you know, exploiting the, the, the natural geometry of the disk and continue to, to, to append things to where the heads already are. OK? Questions about this? Yeah. Well, I'm, so, so let's say this inode was in a directory somewhere. I don't need to change the directory file, right? Because the directory file contains the inode number, right? But the location is changed. Yes, yes, you're getting ahead of me, right? Um, so, so, OK, so I just, I just said this, right? So basically, reads are, let me get to this. I'm, I'm coming there. It's the next thing, right? So reads are handled by the cache. Writes, I can stream to disk at full bandwidth, right? So now, because I'm, I'm limiting my seeks, I'm able to use the full bandwidth of the disk, right? And those bandwidths are going up, and this is nice, right? So this is, on some level, this, this on, on first blush, when you start to look at log structured file systems, you think, this is brilliant, right? Like, wow, this is such a cool idea, OK? Oh, it goes downhill from there. It's so sad. Um, all right, so, so let's talk about some things we need to fix, right? So um, actually, let me, let me get to the next thing, right? So, so you brought this up, right? And it's this question before. So in, in FFS and other types of file systems, 
how do I translate an I know number to a disk block, right? Remember, directories contain I know numbers. The I know number needs to be translated to the location of the I know on disk. So how did I do this in FFS and in the file systems we've talked about, generic file systems we've talked about? How did they translate an I know number to a disk block? I'm going to pick on this part of the room today. How did I do this? I have a number, right? I have the number four, and you need to tell me where is that data, where is that inode, where's the contents of that inode located? Anybody remember? I have an inode map, right? And how do I find the inode map? I, I stored in, yeah, so I stored in a well-known location, right? I've got somewhere on disk. When I format the disk, remember, I created all of the inode maps, and actually all of the inodes. Right? So I knew exactly where those inodes are. There's just flat arrays of inodes located at, at specific points on the disk. Okay? And this is a nice idea because it allows me to find the inode easily. But what problem have I just caused by my log structured file system write? What happened to the inode? It moved. Right? Inodes aren't supposed to move. Okay? So the FFS stored the inode map in a fixed location. Right? For LFS, Inodes are just appended to the log like anything else. And so the inodes can jump around. And this means that I need to potentially, what do you think LFS does about this? What do you think? I've got this really elegant solution. I'm just going to write everything to the end of my append only log. So where does the inode map go? At the end of the append only log, right? When I change the inode location, I log a new inode map. And I just put it right there. Again, most of the, re most of the operations of the inode map are reads, and so they're going to hit the cache. But when I change, when I do what I just did, and I update an inode, and I log it, then I just log the inode map at the end. Right? So this, again, this is kind of like you know, when, when you give somebody a hammer, and they decide to take out some screws with it. Right? Like at some point, you know, like you, uh, this is a great tool, and we can just keep, you know, we'll just keep writing everything to the end of the log and figuring out how to, to sort out the details. Right? OK, so let me go back to this other thing. So remember, the other goal of LFS is, is not just to do writes in one place, but to try to stream as many writes to disk together so I can maximize bandwidth. Right? So when do, when do writes actually happen? When, when do writes actually happen? So again, I can buffer writes in the cache. Right? When, when, can anyone guess when we actually write to the log? So there's, there's one case where we have to write to the log. Right? What case is that? Well, OK, so that's a good one. Sy yeah, so sync. So if I, if I sync the entire file system, then I have to write out any dirty data in the cache to the head of the log. If I sync a file, then I need to write off that file's dirty data. Or when I evict something from the buffer cache, like let's say my super big, fat, humongo buffer cache doesn't soak up everything, right? And I need to, to evict something, then I have to write it at that point, right? But again, I try to coalesce as many writes together so that I can write large portions of uh, data to the disk all at once. Okay? So, okay, so we went through locating inodes. And then, again, what about other file system metadata? I've got these uh, inode uh, block bitmaps and things like that. Where do you guys think these go? There's a theme emerging at the end of the log, right? So you could just log this stuff too, right? Everything just goes to the end of the log. Anything that's written goes to the end of the log. Okay. All right, so now I've got this great thing. I've got this brand new disk. I start logging from byte zero. I just start writing stuff. And then at some point, my log has traveled all the way across the disk. And at that point, I just say, the file system's full, right? Like, no more, there are no more bytes. Is that what happens? There's probably a lot of junk in the log that's dead. Right? There's a lot of data blocks that I've written that are no longer valid. Right? Remember the free space we created before when we updated the inode in the data block? So there's a lot of holes in the log. Right? So there's a lot of that. There might be some valid data in the log, but there's a lot of invalid data in early parts of the log. Okay? And so this starts to become the, the, the big question mark about this approach. Because now I've got this essentially what turns into kind of a, a garbage collection memory management type problem. Right? I've got this log, and it's got a bunch of valid stuff and a bunch of invalid stuff, and I need to somehow sweep through the log, which is usually called log cleaning, to reclaim empty space and, and create kind of a new log. Right? Now, conceptually, you can think of this as happening across the entire disk. 
The way log structured file systems actually do this is they break the disk into segments, right? If it happened across the entire disk, what would happen is that you would get to the end of the disk and then your computer would freeze for two minutes, right, while it compacted the log and then it would start up again, right? So if I break things into smaller pieces, I can be cleaning certain segments while I'm using another segment, right? So, but essentially, again, you can think of this as kind of another mini-me sort of scenario, right? I break up the entire log into little mini-logs and I'm using, you know, I, I start using a mini log. To start using a mini log, I want it to be basically clean. And then when I finish writing across the whole thing, I run some sort of task to compact it and store that data somewhere else so that I can reuse that segment. Okay? So let's look at what happens, right? So here's my segment, and I've got data from two files, the red file and the green file. Um, and let's say that, you know, my log is essentially run out at the end of this segment, right? So this segment is currently not in use. There's some other segment on the disk that I'm currently doing my log uh, writes to. So what do I need to do here? Well, essentially I need to go, I need to sweep through this segment and I need to identify all of the live data and I need to compact it into this new clean segment, right? So I need a, a clean segment on disk and I run a process that essentially collects all of the, uh, again, the live data, writes it, appends it to this, so I've created one kind of in compacted log, and now this segment is ready to be used again, right? So this segment is completely clean, and I can start logging right here, right? And I can just log right across this segment. Right? Questions about how this works, right? So again, here, wh what's the trade-off here? What's, what's the trade-off that I'm making compared with traditional file systems? Right? I've made something easier and then I've created a new problem. What's the thing that I made much, much easier? Right. Writes, right? I've eliminated seeks for writes. Writes are essentially seekless. They all just get appended to the same point on the disk. What's the new problem that I've caused? Fragmentation, Fragmentation and, and, and what, what does that mean I have to do periodically? Cleaning. I have to do this cleaning process, okay? And, and, and uh, most of the debate about FFS, sorry, LFS, has been how well does this part work, right? Because it's clear that the right stuff is brilliant, right? The right stuff is a fantastic idea, but the mess it leaves behind is not necessarily an easy thing to deal with, okay? All right, so again, Alphas things, it seems like a great, great idea, and then, it, it, you know, it's kind of like not having any sort of organizational strategy for your room and just throwing things everywhere, and that works great for a while, and then it's like, oh, I've got to clean things up, I can't find anything anymore, uh, and, and then, you know, you spend a whole weekend wishing that you had had some sort of organizational system in the first place. Yeah. Is the cleaning done in place, or is it obvious stuff? So the, the, I think the cleaning is usually done kind of almost as it's described here, right? So I have, a, I have a new segment that I'm gonna compact things into, and what I want is I wanna produce a completely clean segment, right? You, now you can imagine, right, that, that what, what could I do here? So I could use this segment and just start the log here, right? So I could seek here and just start logging that way, but I don't think that's what they do, right? So yeah, so there's actually a third segment here that's being used by LFS while this is happening, right? And so this requires kind of a free segment, and then I clean into that, and now I've created a new free segment, right? So if I keep doing this enough times, I can always maintain some group of clean segments, right? Question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's actually, that's a great point. So there were, right, so there were versions of this system, right? So let me go back to the, uh, right? So, so what's happened here, right? Well, the interesting thing about this is that I still have an old version of the file in the log, right? So you can imagine that if I had a lot of disk and I didn't mind not being able to clean the log or, or compact it, I can store multiple versions of the same file because if I have a, a, some idea of version and some way of storing versions and, and the file system understands versions, then what I've done here is that if I want a previous version of the file, I just go look at this inode, right? And so, yeah, so this actually does, the, the, you can use a log structured approach to implement a versioning, a versioning file system. I don't know if that's what, how versioning file systems work, uh, but, but yeah, it's a great observation. All right, cleaning, okay. So yeah, so, and, and once you start to bring the cleaner into the picture, right, this is kind of where the debate over LFS starts to get heated, right? Because, because again, it's one of those things where you're making a trade-off, right? It's like I'm giving you this great write performance for a little while, and then you've got to run the cleaner, and, and so things can get terrible, right? Uh-oh. 
got a problem with the slides. Hold on a sec. All right, any other questions on LFS while I'm repairing my slide deck? Mm. Ah, here we go. All right, so let's talk about cleaning, right? So, the, the, again, I've got this cleaner, right? And, and I know that at some point, if, if I don't clean, I'm going to get to the end of the disk and I have this completely dirty disk. And then again, then your machine's just going to stall for like two minutes while the cleaner runs. So this is not good, right? I would also love to run the cleaner when the system is idle, right? So, you know, while you're in class not paying attention to your laptop because you're, you're, uh, you're just reveling in my stimulating lecture, uh, that's a great time for your cleaner to be running, right? So if you guys had any log structured file systems, I could tell if you were paying attention or not because I could listen for the, like, the, the, the heads to be running and the cleaning to be happening, right? Um, however, if you're sitting in here, you know, writing email or whatever, then, then maybe the cleaner <laughs> isn't going to be running as much. Um, other questions. So what about segment size, right? So I didn't tell you how large the segments were that I wanted to clean. And there's a trade-off here, right? So if I use a large segment size, it means that I'm amortizing some of the read and write costs. Because essentially what I could do is I could potentially read the whole segment into memory, do the cleaning in memory, and then stream out all the writes for live data all at once, right? So that can be nice. However, small segments are, can be nice too because they increase the probability that all the blocks in the segment are dead, right? So depending on the file system activity, it's possible that you have a segment that has no live data in it at all. All it contains are old unused inodes, old unused data blocks, old unused metadata, right? And cleaning that segment's really easy. You just toss it, right? So this is, this is a nice corner case uh, and a, a place where you can do a really nice optimization of the cleaning process, right? If you can tell that there's no live data in a segment, you can just discard it, right? So this is nice. So there is kind of a, a runtime trade-off here. And uh, so, so, so what other, so what, what other effect does log cleaning have, particularly on performance for this system? Anybody want to make a guess about why? You know, we've talked a little bit. Again, I mean, this is, this is one of those fun things that the file system community de debated because there's a clear win, right? But, but what would you expect the log cleaning process to be really dependent on? What's that? Well, OK, but let's, let's, let's say that, that I have some idle time. But like when I go to clean the log, how hard it's going to be depends a lot on what? Your usage patterns, right? It's incredibly workload dependent, the, the log cleaning. And so this is one of those cases where, you know, when, when people started to run tests and experiments on log structured file systems, you know, group A could be like, ooh, wow, 100% performance improvement. And group B could be like, you know, 100% performance degradation, right? Because they're using slightly different workloads, and those workloads either cause the cleaner to blow up and consume a huge amount of bandwidth, or they allow the cleaner to run extremely efficiently, right? And there's also there's a huge amount of work in figuring out how to run the cleaner, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, you start to get into sort of standard garbage collection territory here. All right. And so again, so this made it ripe for a great, uh, a great debate within the file system community. Okay. And then finally, I want to point out one other thing. So. So here's another, here's another trade-off that we haven't mentioned so far with log structured file systems, right? What about reads? So let's say, let, forget the cache for a minute. Let's say that the cache doesn't soak up as many reads as we might like. Where is file data located in a log structured file system? It's located all over the place, right? I mean, it just really depends on when stuff was logged. Imagine I have a, yeah, Malik. Well, the, the reads in general can get really, really terrible, right? Uh, on some level, if I keep modifying bits of the file, the reads might be OK. But imagine the following scenario. I have a file that has two data blocks. It's 8K. When I create the file, I write some data into the first data block, and that data block is never changed. And then I continue to make updates to the second data block. 
So what's going to happen in the log structure file system? Well, I'm going to continue to append that second data block to the log. But what about the seek distance between those two data blocks? Where is that first data block in the log? It's right at the beginning, right? And then where is that second data block keeps getting farther and farther and farther and farther away, right? And this, if I'm doing reads and those reads aren't being cached for some reason, then, you know, again, so, so one of the things that's tough about LFS is that the, the file systems that we've been talking about up till now do a lot of work partly because they are more structured to lay out files contiguously on disk, right? We talked about extents, we talked about block allocate, a little bit about block allocation, we talked about FFS. And, and LFS essentially just ignores that. It says, reads will hit the cache. I don't care about reads, right? And I'm, I'm going to optimize for writes, okay? All right, so, so this, and, and again, this, this kind of prompted maybe one of the more interesting back and forth between uh, luminaries in the, in the file system community, right? So again, 1991 is the original a paper from Stanford on LFS by John Oosterhout and, and Mendel Rosenblum. And then in 1993, uh, the log structure file system was re-implemented for BSD by Margot Seltzer, who was a Berkeley graduate student, now is a professor at Harvard. And um, she, uh, along with some colleagues, wrote a paper that questioned some of the performance improvements, right? So again, I mean, there, so what, what, what happened, right? Well, FFS was evolving too, right? So FFS made some changes. And when they benchmarked their system against an enhanced version of FFS, um, it outperformed LFS, OK? Well, you know, the Stanford guys weren't just going to take this line down, right? So uh, John Oosterhout wrote and uh, you know, uh, basically wrote this uh, complaint where he uh, you know, pointed out he, he claimed that they had done a bad job of implementing LFS. He claimed they did a bad job of choosing benchmarks, right? Which again, we, we identified as something that's critical because of how benchmark dependent the cleaner overhead is. And finally, poor analysis. That's my favorite part. Um, like, <laughs> and you're dumb, too. <laughs> um, you couldn't implement it. You couldn't test it. And then even the fact that you couldn't test it didn't prevent you from messing up interpreting the result. Um, OK, so, so now, now, OK, two years later, there's another uh, paper looking at LFS performance pu uh, published by the same Margot Seltzer, uh, again questioning the LFS performance claims, right? So, um, and I won't read this whole quote, but essentially, you know, it says, when FFS is tuned for writing, its large file write performance is approximately 15% better than LFS. Read is 25% worse. But when it's optimized for reading, its large file read and write performance is comparable to LFS, right? So again, I mean, this, this stuff gets very nuanced, right? Large file performance, small file performance. And any time that, you know, somebody made a claim here, the other person would come back and say, oh, you know, you're wrong. So uh, again, uh, Ustra out, it, it, it described the 95 analysis improved, but still thinks that it was misleading, right? And uh, at some level, uh, this, this was kind of a fun back and forth between people in this community, right? So this is Margot Seltzer. Uh, does anyone know what else Margot Seltzer did to you? What's that? She's, she's done a lot of work on databases. She taught this class. What else is she responsible for? Yeah, the OS-161 system that is uh, your own little personal torture chamber. She looks like such a nice person, right? She is a very nice person. She's married, What's, she's married to Keith Bostick, yeah, another uh, uh, really well-known BSD developer. And she taught me this class. So. All right, so uh, we're done with file systems, right? We are finished. File system unit is over. Yeah? Right, right. So, so you're right. When we do cleaning, we do have a chance to adjust the layout of files on disk, right? Because on some level, when we start to clean things, we see more at once, right? When we're doing writes, we're just seeing one block at a time. So when we did a read, we could, sorry, when we did a clean, we could correct that situation where there's this huge span between these two uh, blocks that are next to each other in the file, assuming they're in the same segment, right? If parts of the file are now located in multiple segments, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly what they did here, right? But, but yeah, so when I clean, I have some uh, chances to, to, uh, to adjust that. Okay, so on, on, next week's going to be kind of a grab bag week. Right? We're going to do uh, one lecture on operating system structure, which is something that's normally covered a little bit earlier, but I think 
it's nice that we've waited because you guys will have a little more context for this. So we're going to talk about uh, monolithic kernels. We're going to talk about multi-kernels. We're going to talk about microkernels. We're going to talk about exokernels. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll make up some sort of name for a new kernel and see if you guys notice. Um, and then uh, I think what I'm going to do next week on Wednesday and Friday is talk about performance. Um, I don't think, I have to remember, I have to look at assignment three again. I don't think, there used to be a performance component to assignment three. I'm not sure it's going to be part of the assignment this year. But I, I would like to introduce you to some guys, to some ideas about sort of how to do performance analysis, how to do benchmarking, and how to make sure that you're working on the right performance problem, right? Because that is the key thing that people miss, and it's something that will be useful for you guys to take with you from this class to whatever you end up doing next. So anyway, have a great weekend. If you're still fighting assignment two, good luck. And uh, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>